Okay, we don't have an enormous amount of time, so um, let's get straight into it. Uh, you know who we all are. Um, it is working, isn't it? Yes, good. I thought it was. Um, it's difficult for me because I've got hearing aids to, I, and so does Mike, and I have to shout at him. So if I, if, if you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to mention the arm. Anyway, but anyway, the Australian accent. Uh, first, actually, I'd like to congratulate John on getting it up, conceiving of it, and getting it up because uh, at the time I was actually on the Visual Arts Board, and it was one of the proposals that came up for funding. Uh, and at the same time, there was another show that was proposed for the Guggenheim, uh, you know, with um, big name attachment and so on. So, um, of course, the Australia Council decided to fund the Guggenheim show, which was a complete shambles, and overlooked John's very tight and very precise, uh, very powerful show with these three artists. The interesting thing was that at that time, um, they were all just developing a new body of work. I mean, we all know um, Imance uh, from the canvas board works, but in 1984, he'd only been doing it for two or three years. So it was a, an opportunity to very cheaply, in the absence of funding, which I think works in its favor, this show, to be honest. Um, he actually was able to take a number of very major works in a few boxes. You know. um, and that was the first time that had happened for an international show with him. Um, Ken, um, John wasn't terribly interested in taking installation because, A, because it's unwieldy, and B, because Ken's installations in those days often broke down and <laughs> he, thought, he thought drawings would be better. Um, and he saw, he saw, I don't know where John actually saw um, the paintings because although Ken had been painting since the 50s, um, he, he hadn't actually publicly displayed them. And these works were, were a new set of works done pretty much for the show. Um, and they could be rolled up and virtually carried under the arm kind of thing. Um, Mike had also recently scaled up from doing little A4 drawings, about 20 of which are in the gallery collection, um, and, and started doing large-scale works, some of which um, uh, became part of installations where they were anamorphic, they wrapped around a room, and you looked in uh, from a particular perspective, a bit like um, Holbein's ambassadors, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so all three of them were doing something that they hadn't been well known for here, and it was very fresh, very original, and very powerful, I think. And the show was so successful in New York, it went on to the Corcoran, um, and uh, that was the background to that. Uh, and just, okay, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask the three of you um, was um, whether, in fact, showing in New York at that point, which was, I think, for all three of you, a kind of high point in your career, in a way, um, whether that impacted on your future practice um, and your reception back home. Did it, Mike? Yeah, it was exhilarating. Um, I'd never been to New York before, so, um, you know, arriving and being met by a limousine and sort of driven into, and to a five-star hotel was um, unusual for me. So it was, uh, it was, um, yeah, it was an exhilarating experience. And um, it also, PS1, you know, had big walls, so it gave us the opportunity to really, we, we really did three one-person exhibitions, I think. And uh, that was immensely satisfying too because I felt that I could establish a kind of coherence that very often you can't in Australian exhibitions. You know, you're kind of allocated, um, you know, small area and you do what you can do. But this was very generous. So, yep, it had a tremendous impact for me. Ken? Um, I hope this works without having to... You can hear me? Um, well, I suppose I have to say that, um, I mean, al already had been making work and, and uh, still finding my way, so I was very surprised when John Caldor um, approached me about this project and also taken aback a bit because his reputation was so strong um, and, and what he'd been doing had, had really so sort of knocked the socks off Australian art. And so it was a, an, an enormous sort of um, um, 
act of faith that he would approach an artist with the possibility of showing in New York of all places. So um, it was that event was something that was both exciting and and and, a, and also created a bit of trepidation. Um, I must relate to you that when he first told me that, that um, uh, he was considering me for the show, I said, oh, that's great, I've got a couple of good ideas for installations. And he sort of smiled benignly and in that quiet voice said to me, well, Ken, you know, um, there's a reputation for your installations rather breaking down too frequently. <laughs> I suggest that you do paintings. Paintings, I thought? I'd hardly done any paintings. Um, but nevertheless, that's what I eventually finished up doing. And um, <clears throat> it was aided and abetted in terms of ideas of what I could do with a previous visit to Japan where, I, where I'd been absolutely stunned by um, Japanese traditional um, work, particularly the Gaki series, which you, you may know, which are velvety black drawings of of figures doing unspeakable things, so uh, that appealed to me. Um, and then, of course, the actual event. Uh, we were pitted like fighters against the German Expressionists, um, which I thought was a sort of unnecessary thing. We, we stood, I think, I think Mike made the point that we knocked the socks off them, and uh, I agree, you know, I think, I think what we had to offer was um, something quite unique. Um, anyway, so to finally wrap up, that did in, in fact lead to other things, the, the Paris Biennale the following year. So it was um, a tremendous boost, uh, both in terms of opportunity and, and confidence to get on with one's work. Evans, how about you? <coughs> Is this working? Yep. Yeah, no, well, um, I love New York, actually. And I did actually, we went to New York in 1979 before John's show. So I already had a kind of taste of it. So when this show was proposed, um, oh well, I was over the moon really. And um, I think John came to my uh, studio in, which was in Mossman overlooking Sirius Cove. And I was just working in the spare bedroom. I didn't have a studio as such. And that was one of the reasons I started using uh, canvas boards. And John basically said, well, you know, he, he liked the work and um, yeah, just do your best. Uh, you didn't say I should change anything. And um, so I just kind of went for it in a way. Uh, the canvas boards, I'd only just started on them and uh, it gave me a real impetus to kind of, you know, develop them into something. Um, I'd been in uh, Documenta 7 in 82, uh, which was just a bit too early um, in terms of showing the canvas boards there, uh, which would also have been great. But um, two years later, I was kind of ready, um, yeah, but ready for New York. And uh, fortunately, um, as a result of John's show, I got a very good dealer in New York, Best Cutler Gallery. And in fact, I had four solo shows with her, you know, after the show, after John's show, you know, to the end of the decade. So, I meant I was in New York uh, quite a lot of the time. And um, yeah, no, it was all a fairy tale. Thank you. And um, I, I mentioned, you know, that each of the artists was in a way launching into a new phase in their career. Uh, so it was very fresh, very energetic. Um, Mike coming from um, primarily performance and self-portraiture growing out of that. I mean, Ken also, I mean, let's face it, in 75, 77, doing performances, um, body tableaus and so on. And Iman's coming somewhat out of Duchamp into uh, a kind of fairly conceptual practice. So um, what was interesting was that some of the press um, immediately assumed that these were the three Australians representing zeitgeist or the new spirit of painting um, that Norman Rosenthal and Jacomides had done uh, in London and in Berlin, um, which is, you know, except 
really the sort of expressive figuration um, that, that plagued Australia as well, actually, in the, in the early 80s. But, I mean, the thing was, I think that there was a complete misconception of, of all of the works because it completely failed to understand its origin, where it was growing out of, you know. Um, I mean, Mike's self-portraiture grows out of performance. I mean, Ken's, um, actually, some of the works you showed in New York were photographs of performances that you did uh, of the suspended body or, or the propped body against drawings um, of the same subject. Um, and Iman's work, obviously, um, quite a conceptual step. I mean, I think maybe it became more associated with postmodernism later, but I think initially, you know, the influence of de Chirico, um, the work I bought from that show for the gallery was Pedophysical Man, um, is very much based on the archaeologist by de Chirico and Mike Pye's Trojan Horse, you know, also from that show. Um, very powerful works. With, with Ken, we got, um, from the Paris show, in five, we got the um, Stone Circle. Well, we didn't really get the Stone Circle. We had to make it again because they wouldn't send it home, would they? They wouldn't send the Stone Circle that you made in Paris home, so we had to go and collect more river rocks. Threw them out. <laughs> I didn't tell the trustees at the time, this work doesn't actually exist, but, you know... Once we'd bought it, you know, we were able to go and collect some stones. And, make, and that's become one of the real favourites of the gallery collection, I have to say. It, it won a prize that the Herald ran um, for the most popular public artwork in Sydney. And uh, it came in before Fires On and before, um, you know, the, any, any other American works or anything in the city. So um, that was a good moment for, I think, all of you anyway. Um, but then um, the show came back to Australia. And at this point, because it had been so successful in America, uh, John pointed out that the um, Australia Council decided they'd fund a tour. That, and so the show went to Perth and here to Sydney. And it arrived in Sydney almost the same time as I did in 84. So it was a, it was a great thing to have happen on my arrival in Sydney, to have these three artists uh, in a great exhibition. So. Um, Mike, tell us a little bit more about um, how the particular development of the drawings took place, the large-scale drawings. At the time? At the time, yeah. Um, and how it led on to other things. OK, so I'd been... Um, I'd had sort of, prior to that, I'd had like uh, 12, 13 years of sort of unrelenting performance art, really. And um, I went to Adelaide, I've told this story before, in 1983, I think it was, or 81, I can't remember now, to do a 24-hour smile. <laughs> and um, all my performances were like this. They still are. I mean, I've done something like 250 performances in the last 48 years. Um, and I, they're as hardcore now as they were then. And uh, they all start the same way. I get this lunatic idea, it obsesses me, and I do it. But this time round, um, four minutes, five minutes into the 24-hour smile, I knew I was in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a sort of, it was a failure. Yeah, I, I, I got lost in this thing. I was kind of crazy by the end of this session. I, you know, within an hour, my face was just like this death mask. I could feel it. And um, I came back to Sydney and I was a well-known Australian artist and I no longer had a medium. And um, so I went back into the documentation of the performances. I was wondering what the hell I could do. How could I break out of this and go forward? And I realised that the performance photography, some of it was sort of heroic and sort of suitable to be blown up and sort of exhibited, but there was a lot of very abject, pathetic stuff. And I thought, I'll draw these photographs, the really fragile, rattled ones. And uh, I'd not drawn previous to that. And Tony, I met, remember, come, came round to my front room in, 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 uh, in um, Homewood. Homewood Street in South Newtown. 
uh, charcoal and mess all over the floor, but on the walls were pins and sheets of typing paper. And there was this dreadful silence. Tony said to me, who did these drawings? And I said, I did. <laughs> and um, the vulnerability of that moment, and Tony's good graces in handling it, I think, but the vulnerability of that moment was actually that was, the, that was the catalyst that enabled me to not only go on with drawing, and I've gone on with drawing ever since. I draw almost every day, two, three, four hours a day. I draw obsessively. But it enabled me to go on with performance art. And it enabled me to understand something about performance art that I don't think I'd quite brought into focus at that point that performance art is, is inherently vulnerable, both at the personal level and at the collective level. That I put my audience under strain, similar strain to the strain that I put myself under. And it's that reciprocity that's enabled me to really investigate, not just the psychology of what I'm doing, but the politics of the performative. And more and more in the last 20, 25 years, I've foregrounded this political aspect of performance art to continue making performance art. Thanks, Mike. Now, Ken, um, you know, it baffles curators and art historians because from the 50s, he was actually doing paintings, or he said he hadn't, done, he hadn't shown paintings. Um, and here he was showing large-scale drawings. But he's always done drawings, and he's got stacks of drawings, many of which are sketches for potential performances, either with his own body, or, and more recently, he's been working with um, dancers, uh, or, or looking at ideas for installation, and so on. At the moment, I got a little show on down in Wollongong of small sculptures and maquettes, um, all of which relate to the performances. You know, you're balancing your body instead of balancing rocks. You're, um, you're propping between two great beams, apparently. Um, these tableau that you did in 75 and again, others in 77, so on. All of this, I mean, that in a way continues. And today, um, Ken's still doing uh, kinetic installations, but now he's using a team of four dancers he's worked with for maybe 20 years now, I guess. Um, and so he creates sets, he creates machinery, a bit like Oscar Schlemmer or somebody, for these people to work with. And, um, and the dancers and, and the musicians who create the music, um, they choreograph their work according to your scenario and also the music. Now, all of those things are continuous. Uh, he's still painting like crazy in the studio. I keep getting these phone calls. Tony, you haven't seen my last six paintings. Oh, yes, well, I'll be down. I will be seeing the next last six paintings. Don't worry. But I think that, that sort of, um, the fact that he does all these different things simultaneously has really confused the critical community. Um, I, it's the only reason I can imagine why I wasn't able to get any funding for your book, my dear, because, you know, Fortunately, Art Ange came to the party and we were able to do it. And it's a bloody beautiful book. If you haven't got one, you better go and get one from the bookshop. It's, it, 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 it's a book, it's a tome, but it's a tome that's totally um, earned, I think, by Ken's contribution. So, Ken, I mean, you're, you're, I know that you've actually halted some of the performance work to make big new installations in the studio. And they're incredibly ambitious things. And you put them up and you invite a few friends and maybe people who might be interested to come and have a look at them, and then you take them down and do something else. Tell us about your life and why you put yourself in such a precarious position. Well, I, I, needless to say, after, after the uh, Australian accent, I gave up painting and went back to doing installations. Um, and some of them, uh, uh, overly ambitious, um, but all sort of trying to... I, I was listening to the way in which Mike explained the 
the fundamentals of the, the foundation uh, of his work and I was trying to think of um, how I could express something similar. Um, it just, the only way I can put it is that it refers to our, our common shared experience, our nightmares and our fears and our loves and our desires that underpins all the installations and, and the sort of what I call psychodrama theatre works that I was able to do with some dancers and musicians. Um, one of the little things that I did after some of those was to realise that I didn't want the dancers, um, well, they don't like being called dancers, incidentally, they're dance performers. I must remember that. Um, the dance performers would pick the most saccharine sort of music, you know, uh, that tugged at the heartstrings and, and all the rest of it made it so schmaltzy. And um, I realised that what I needed to do when I had a project in mind was to actually have writ music written, so I would commission uh, composers to do that, and that's proved to be very successful. And it also led me to come to the realisation that Australia is absolutely rich with young composers and musicians. It's quite amazing. And they sort of work all over the world, and I've been lucky to have them work with me. Um, on the other side of the ledger is what Tony referred to as this sort of obsession about painting. I'm not a painter, but I have this obsession of wanting to do it, so I paint at home and I don't, and I don't show the work. Um, what else? Nothing much. Oh, that's right. We're immense. Do you want to add anything to um, you know, your experience of working out of the canvas boards and into other yeah, ideas? Well, um, yes. Um, yeah, no, I've done a, um, a new work, actually, for the John's show, which is just to the left there. And the reason I did that was because um, when I was a first-year architecture student, I actually worked on the Cristo Rep Coast, uh, you know, full-time for three weeks. And, um, yeah, I met an interesting artist uh, who was doing the same, uh, Ian Millis, who... Um, told me um, there were two things I needed to do. One was to join the Contemporary Art Society. I mean, I was studying architecture, um, so I joined and um, started exhibiting with them. And the other thing was to subscribe to Art Forum, uh, which I did too, um, you know, age of 20. Um, anyway, to, to go back to the canvas boards, um, when I, I first started them in 1981, there were a few, few artists who played around with canvas boards, but I had the um, great idea, you only need one idea, which was to put them together um, to make large-scale works. And I also started numbering them um, from one uh, to infinity. So at the moment, when I, well, in John's show, I think it was in the low thousands, um, but I've continued, and in a way, the, um, the work, each panel actually forms part of a kind of total work. Um, and I'm now over 110,000 panels, which might seem pretty paltry. Um, it's quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'm very grateful for, to John and his show because it actually gave me some momentum you know, to continue on that project. And I'm still working on it. No, that's great. And I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, the scale of it um, is impressive. But I think, um, you know, you've, you've gone through quite a few moves in terms of the content. I mean, I thought at one stage you were definitely one of those postmodern sort of appropriation artists, full stop. And then I think I rang you up when I saw you starting work on the Colin McCann series. I said, Imads, you're not being ironic about this, are you? And I think you said, um, if you chase something hard enough for long enough, you kind of fall over the edge into it, as it were. Uh, and do you still stand by that? Yeah, well, um, I mean, in a way, um, I guess there was a slight 
mixture of irony and seriousness. I mean, the, uh, the works that I showed at PS1 were all quotations, even though they, they were from actually Latvian uh, sources that no one would know. And I've only kind of revealed them publicly in the last year, really. Um, so it looked like kind of neo-expressionism, but it was actually still quotation. Um, but as soon as I started to show in New York, I sort of changed tack and um, started to quote kind of recognisable artists like uh, Kuki and Kia and, um, and others. And um, so I was immediately put into the other camp, which was the postmodern camp, you know, with people like Sherry Levine and uh, Mike Bidlow and um, Philip Taff. And in fact, I got a lot of, um, I got a really bad review from Donald Cuspert saying how shallow I was. Um, but in fact, it signaled to the other part of the art world that I was sort of one of them. So, um, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a good idea to sort of change tack like that. And incidentally, um, it's one of the most beautiful shows I've seen. Uh, and I've been to Venice. The most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things is at Ross and Oxley's at the moment. That show of yours is extraordinary and very nice too that you've got that film made by the Latvians about your life and work. Uh, so if you haven't been down, am I allowed to mention, mention Rosalind? Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> it is a great show. Thank and you. I think I've probably got the wind up now. Um, yep, okay. So thank you very much, all three of you, and for your contribution. And thank you, John, for making it all possible and for doing, I think, one of the best shows I've ever seen, to be honest. Thank you. <laughs>